Part 1. To listen to our weekly hour on conservation issues. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Thank you very much for tuning in today to listen to our weekly hour on conservation issues. Last week we spoke about the impact of environmental changes on primates and this week to continue the theme we have invited in a specialist by the name of Professor Andrew Ripley all the way from USA to tell us more about the problems faced by the cat family. Professor Ripley, thank you very much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. So I understand that you spent a great proportion of your time travelling the globe and monitoring changes in population levels of the cat family. Yes, that's correct. Of course, we're not talking about the domestic cat here, but their majestic cousins such as the lion, tiger and jaguar, to name but a few. Which member of the cat family do you yourself find to be the most fascinating? Well, I've spent a lot of time recently studying jaguars. But the lion is still my personal favourite. It is the world's most social cat, and unusual in the way in which it chooses to group together with others of its species. The prides of lions basking in the sunshine are probably one of people's most vivid perceptions of the African bush. Yes, certainly. I totally agree with you. Can you tell me the current lion population in Africa these days? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Well, it's very difficult to measure it accurately. Figures range from 100,000 to as few as 30,000. But it's generally estimated that there are 50,000. In order to maintain the population and protect the species from poachers, many are moved to protected areas. Which member of the cat family do you feel is most at risk? For different reasons, a number of species of the cat family are endangered. Sometimes due to natural predators or environmental changes, but mainly because of the threat of hunters. For example, I'm sure you're aware the bones and body parts of tigers have been and still are traditionally used in medicines in the Far East. Because of this and the demand for medicine made from tiger parts, their numbers have been falling for some time. And to date there are fewer than 6,000 tigers living in their natural habitat of the forests and plains of Asia. What is being done to curb the population decrease? Well, specialists such as myself work closely with conservationist groups such as the World Wildlife Federation, or WWF, uh, to protect tigers from illegal hunting. WWF considers the drop in tiger numbers to be catastrophic and they are working hard to conserve the populations in China, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam and Russia. I understand that poaching is not the only problem faced by the leopard. Let me get this right. Is it the snow leopard which lives in the mountains in Asia? Yes, it is. Poaching has been a problem, but not the most important. Its natural prey, the animals it hunts, is declining too. Its natural habitat in high-altitude areas, specifically the pastures, is threatened by the growth of agriculture. It is this that is causing the main problem for the snow leopard. It is going to be extremely difficult for numbers to recover. But again, the WWF has been working hard to continue to fund projects to aid the snow leopard in Nepal and Pakistan and hopefully Bhutan very soon. Well, this is fascinating information you are giving us, Professor. We are just going into a short commercial break. 
When we come back, I have a few questions for you about the Puma and the Jaguar. Remember, listeners, there will be an opportunity to phone in and voice any opinions or questions you may have for the Professor in 10 minutes. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the principal of a university welcoming his students. Look at questions 11 to 17. Listen to the first part of the lecture and answer questions 11 to 17. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Donovan, the principal of Don Levy University, and I would like to welcome you to the Dinglewood campus, which is one of the three campuses belonging to this university. This campus, Dinglewood, is where I have my office, and it's also the location of the Languages and Science campus, so some of you will be studying here. Dinglewood is the most northerly campus. The business studies blocks are in the Churchdown campus in the centre of town, and the southern or Trailway campus, where history and architecture are situated, is to the south of the town. Those of you who are enrolled in any of those courses will be taken to your respective buildings at the end of this meeting. Those of you studying on the Dinglewood campus, you will have a tour later too. This building we are assembled in is the office or administration block, Block 39, and is where the weekly meetings are held. You are welcome to attend these meetings, as are all the university staff. You may want to, as many university issues are discussed at these weekly meetings. The meetings take place at 1.30 every Tuesday, so please stop by. Two other important buildings are also located on this campus, the cafeteria and the on-site shop. You can purchase all the required books and any stationery you need for your courses at this shop. Please bear in mind that even though you have shown your ID passes to enter the site, you still need to use them again to buy anything in the shop or cafeteria. This is for security reasons. Now look at questions 18 to 20. As the lecture continues, answer questions 18 to 20. Now, if I could draw your attention to the back page of your joining instructions booklet, you will see a small map of this campus, Dingle Wood. The block we are in now, the office and administration block, is located between the Languages Centre, block 38, and the physics school, block 30, that's 3-0. Oh. 
These are both on the right of the plan. The cafeteria, which is open from 7 a.m. to 9:30 p.m., is on the left of the plan. It is between the chemistry block, number 35, and the university shop, block 33. At the university shop, you can get all you will need in terms of course materials. The biology block is block number 29. And you'll find the biology block between the chemistry block and the languages centre. Be careful with the numbers, as they are not always logical. As you will see, there are gardens on the right-hand side of the gate. These are being extended over the next two months, and a memorial fountain is being installed in the middle of the campus. This means that the campus will be very noisy during normal working hours. However, the campus will look much nicer when it is all finished. Right. So that's it for your initial campus orientation. At this point, could the language students all follow me, please? And the rest of you, please assemble under the banners which show your main topic of study. And you will be directed to the other campuses. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between Wolfgang and his new friend Mary, who has already been at the college for a few months. In the first part of the conversation, they're talking about a social activity program at college. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Hi, Wolfgang. Ah,、oh, Mary, how are you? Oh, fine. How's it going? Have you just had a class? Yes, I just finished my listening class. It was a little bit difficult. Yeah, yeah. It's always difficult when you first arrive somewhere. I found it quite hard when I first arrived.、Mm. But you know what really made a difference was going on these social activities that the the college arranges for you. It kind of gives you a chance to practice your English. And、mm. I've heard that the college is pretty good about organising those kinds of things. How do how do I find out about it? Well, I've just picked up a schedule today. Let's. Let's have a look at it. Here it is. What is it? A schedule for for this week or? Yeah, yeah. Let's have a look. Okay, yeah. Maybe we can do some things together. In fact. Yeah, that would be great. So. Let's see. What are they doing tonight? Monday night. Well, they've. So. Oh, they've got singing with guitar. So I went to this last week. It's. Oh really? Yes, it's quite good fun. Is it pretty good? Yeah, yeah. What do they do? Do they have a concert or? It's they teach you、um, modern and traditional songs. Hmm. Well, I'm not much of a singer, but.、Uh... Oh, come on! You should go. It's really good fun. Well, I suppose it'd be a good way to practice my English. Yeah, 'cause you learn. 
kind of British folk songs and things. It's, yeah, it's really interesting. Oh, but look at that. That starts at eight. But I notice at nine o'clock there's a, a late night coach to Cambridge for a film. I think I'd want to try, go to try that. Uh, what time does this singing thing finish? Do you know? Oh, well, usually it, it kind of lasts about two hours. But I mean, we can always leave earlier. They don't mind. Do. Oh, OK. So we can do both then? Yeah, so. Right. So that's at nine o'clock. Yeah, yeah. What movie is it? Let me see. Oh, oh, it's Rocky. Have you seen it? Rocky. Rocky? Oh, that's. That's uh, the one with Richard Dreyfus, isn't it? Richard Dreyfus? No, it's to Sylvester Stallone. Oh, yes, I remember now. American movie. Yes, I haven't seen that. I want to see that. Good, let's go to that. All right. Oh, OK. Oh, did you see on Tuesday that there's a tennis tournament? Tennis? Hmm, what time is that? Well, that's at four o'clock in the afternoon. Where is it? Is it on campus or...? No, no. It's at w Wembley, so that's in London. Oh, oh, so that. It's pretty far away then. What time will it be coming back? Um, so it... The coach gets back at midnight. Oh, midnight. Well, hmm, tell you what, I think maybe I'd better cancel on that because I've got a class Wednesday morning and I'm afraid, at about 8.30, I'm afraid if I came back that late I probably would, uh, I'd be very tired in class and actually I, I'm more into football myself anyway. Oh, football? Well, did you see there's a football match on Wednesday? Oh, yeah? Well, who's, who's playing? Let's see. Oh, it's England and Brazil. Oh, I really want to see that. Would you like to go together? Yeah, sure. What time is it? Let me see. It says 15.30. So that would be 3.30. 3.30, huh. Now, I've got a... I have a lecture uh, right after lunch on Wednesday at 1.30. Uh-huh. What lecture's that? Oh, well, there's a journalist coming from the BBC. He's going to talk about his experiences as a foreign correspondent. Oh, that sounds interesting. Would you, would you like to go? Yeah, what time do you say it was? Uh, right after lunch, around 1.30. Oh, 1.30. I have a class then. What a sh... Oh, yeah. Oh, that's too bad. Well, what time does your class finish? Finishes, it's an hour long, so it finishes at 2.30. Oh, well, I shouldn't imagine. The lecture shouldn't go much later than that either. So after your class and after my lecture, we can get together to go to the football game. OK, so we can meet... Let's see, maybe 3 o'clock or, or maybe 3.15. Yeah, I think 3.15 would be all right. OK, where should we meet? Well, usually these, on these kind of trips, the coach leaves from in front of the dining hall. So maybe we could meet there. OK. So in front of the dining hall at 3.15. That sounds fine. Yeah, right. On Thursday, there's an international evening in school hall. Yeah, all songs and dances performance by students from all over the world. That's very interesting. Would you like to go and see? Yes, when is it? It will start at 8. Shall we meet at 7.50 in front of the school hall? Fine, 7.50 in front of the school hall. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Oh, and another thing I definitely want to do this weekend uh, is to go and see... Uh, they're going to have a trip to Stratford on Avon. I think it's on 
Let me see. What day is that? Friday. I think my roommate told me. Oh, Friday. Would you like to go to that? Yeah, but are you sure it's Friday? I thought that's what he said, but I'm, I might have been mistaken. Well, usually these things are on weekends. Right. Let's see here. Oh, you're right. Yeah, Saturday morning, eight thirty. Aha.、Uh-huh. Right. Friday's the disco. Oh, disco. Yeah. So actually, I've arranged to go with some of my friends. So if you'd like to come along with us. Oh, that would be very nice. Yeah. Yeah, you can meet some more students. Oh well, what time? What time shall we go to that then? Well, it starts at what time? Eight thirty. But we don't want to go too early, so let's say nine or nine thirty. Let's say nine thirty. Okay, yeah, we can meet there. Um, but we'd better not stay too late because the Stratford thing is uh pretty early in the morning. The bus will be leaving at eight thirty. Oh yeah, right. So we want to make sure we get up for that. Yeah. Say, by the way, this trip, um, since it's uh quite a f- way away, do we have to pay anything extra for that, or is it free? Hmm. Well, usually most of the trips are free, but yeah, for these ones which are quite a distance away, then we usually have to pay a a little bit extra. Is it a lot or? No, it's usually about twenty-five pounds, something like that. Oh, well, do we have to tell them ahead of time that we're going to go? Yeah, usually you have to sign up a couple of days in advance. So. Oh, where where do we do that? Um. Well, you do that at the student services office. So you have to go and see one of the social activities officers. Oh, so I just tell them that I want to go and to pay my money and then sign my name. Well, I think I'll go ahead and do that today. Actually, I've got some free time right now. Do you know where I go to do that? Um. Yeah. Yeah. It's the the student services office. It's just across the road from here. Oh. Okay. Um. Well, across the kind of. You mean the green building over there? Yeah. Yeah. So it's on the second floor. Oh. Okay. Well, tell you what. Um. Are you going to the Shakespeare thing? Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Would you like me to go ahead and sign you up as well? Oh yes, yeah, that'd be great. But well, I haven't got any money on me at the moment. Oh, don't worry about the money. That's fine. You can pay me back this evening. I'll go and sign us now, and then when I meet you tonight at the singing, you can uh give me the money then. Oh well, if if you are sure, that'd be great. No, it's no problem. Okay. Oh, is that the time? I'd better go. I've got a class. I'll be late. Okay, sorry. I'll see you later then. All right. See you tonight. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You're going to listen to a talk about tea in the UK. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. 
During the 1930s, there was a popular song which had the title Everything Stops for Tea, and to millions of British people, a restful cuppa is still an ideal way to relax for a few minutes from the rigours of the day. The English custom of drinking tea has its roots in the 17th and 18th centuries. When first imported to Britain, the exotic cha, cha or cha, as the Chinese tea was variously called, was considered a man's drink to be enjoyed with colleagues at London coffee shops. These were popular meeting places for many walks of life, politicians, lawyers, poets, actors and writers. Many London clubs began in this manner, and the famous Lloyd's Insurance underwriters started out as Lloyd's Coffee House. In 1706, the first coffee house that offered tea was Tom's Coffee House, owned by Thomas Twining. He realised that he needed to introduce an added attraction to compete with the many other coffee houses in London, and tea was rare, exotic, and extremely expensive. With these credentials, tea became an exclusive drink and enabled Twining to open a tea shop under the sign of the Golden Lion in the Strand. By the 18th century, the ladies of the more affluent classes were going China mad, using tea as an excuse for displaying their extravagant purchases of Chinese porcelain and Dresden tea sets. A comprehensive tea tray would consist of a teapot and stand, teacups and saucers, sugar bowl, milk jug and basin for discarded tea and tea leaves. Tea was still expensive and kept in locked tea caddies. Skilled craftsmen fashioned caddies of carved inlaid woods fitted with crystal and precious metals. To ensure the servants weren't tempted by this priceless commodity, the caddy was kept locked and only the mistress of the house held the key and prepared tea when guests came to visit. No well-brought-up young Englishwoman could consider herself socially acceptable unless she knew how to brew a proper cup of tea. As the 18th century progressed, changes in commerce and working hours resulted in the main meal of the day being taken much later in the evening. The prospect of lasting from breakfast until evening did not appeal to the Duchess of Bedford, who is usually credited with being the first to alleviate late afternoon hunger pangs by introducing a small four o'clock meal served with tea. With time, the light, wafer-thin toast or delicate white bread gave way to exotic fillings like tomato and egg, cucumber, chicken or potted shrimps, followed by buttered scones, crumpets or elegant pastries. The popularity of tea continued to spread, but it was not until 1839 that the first shipment of Assam tea, Indian tea was landed in Britain. A healthy trade with India was soon established, and tea clippers, like the Cutty Sark, now a museum in a dry dock at Greenwich, were reaching the peak of their sailing days. In 1879, the first limited shipments of Ceylon tea began to arrive, and by 1880 this had been firmly established alongside Indian and China teas, giving the broad range of teas that are available today. There have been few changes in three centuries of tea trading. London is still the centre, and indeed Twining still has a shop on the site of the original Tom's Coffee House at 216 The Strand. The name Twining has been linked with tea for over 280 years. Indeed, it was Richard Twining, in his capacity as chairman of the dealers of tea, who in 1784 persuaded Prime Minister William Pitt to reduce the high tax on tea, making the beverage more accessible to the general public. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.